uh, introduce Louis Leonard from uh, the Perimeter Institute. Louis has worked on uh, a variety of topics in uh, general relativity, both uh, canonical ones and, and uh, the modern aspects of it. And uh, today he's going to tell us about surprises in the strong and the Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Africa. I'm impressed. This is such a Great, beautiful city, and also how fit people must be in order to go up and down. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you today, uh, or trying to uh, describe, is a few things about the behavior of general gravity in nonlinearity, what we know and maybe what we really don't know, uh, and some opportunities towards the future. I need to uh, go a little bit back in time and kind of describe a little bit of, of uh, the situation of zero activity. Of course, to make a very, very broad generalization, I could say, well, we're, we're just celebrating the uh, 100th anniversary of the theory. And arguably, the first 50 years of this amazing theory that I sent before was, uh, by many, by many uh, arguments, a state of confusion. There were lots of discussion back and forth trying to understand how this very, very complicated theory extremely geometrical in nature, describe a very set, a set of very complicated partial differential equations. How is it that we were supposed to understand? It was in the second half of the first century that people began to really come to grasp with uh, many of the consequences of the theory, the existence of gravitational waves, the existence of or the possibility of black holes, singularities, etc. But still was the case that the theory uh, had in it um, this search for solutions it was a very complicated task. Yet, because the theory uh, is very geometrical, because it's very geometrical link in nature, even though very, very, very isolated solutions in very, very, very specialized situations were known, there were uh, uh, really smart people who were able to essentially, uh, in purely geometrical terms, map out uh, broad aspects of the theory. For instance, the development of singularities. They are uh, very well-known theorems by Penrose and Hawking that said, given some initial conditions um, for arbitrary pretty much configurations, uh, you knew for a fact that a singularity would arise in the future, and then Hawking turned it up uh, and then tried to say, or said something about the big bang singularity. But as we move to the second century of the, of the theory, um, things are about to change in a very significant way, and I'll discuss a few things. Um, but even though, uh, if we were to make a pause here and then just try to think of the, little, the, the few things we know of the theory or the special and special solutions of the theory, it is very clearly the case that we have done a lot with it. Beyond just, say, understanding the issues of similarities, we have turned out around these solutions that we know, describing black holes in essentially quiescent state, to try to explain things like amazing uh, amazingly powerful phenomena at uh, different places in the universe. For instance, here, that some uh, picture of a quasar uh, and, uh, and our maybe, uh, I think it's a uh, galaxy as well that has these tremendously energetic jets going uh, uh, at very, very high speeds. And at some point, uh, these jets are so, so large in scale that even pale, uh, the, the galaxy scale pale in comparison with that. So trying to understand that from first principles, it has been instrumental to consider that black holes lurk at the, at the, at the center uh, and produce or, or become a significant part of the engine that powers this thing. But the theory we know has lots of problems. In particular, we uh, know that uh, does not or fails at very large curvature scales where it should be preceded or superseded sorry, by something else. And the state of, of the theory could be summarized even by this well-known characters. So here is Dolph Lundgren in this movie, and he'll write down Einstein's equation. So this is already a testament of how much Einstein's theory of relativity have permeated society. And it's going to tell you what he thinks of the theory and the fact that it doesn't quite work uh, to try to marry it with quantum mechanics. Uh, right about now. <laughs> And so we know the theory should break, and how, uh, we know the, the, the theory should break, but not so much of where and how, because if you knew this, it would be already telling us some particular indications how to go about trying to change the theory 
and, and have something that would replace it. Fortunately, already um, down the corner, already uh, 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 we have one evidence of that, we're beginning to be able to test a theory at scales that we have never been able to do so, and maybe some subtle departures will arise. We will be able to determine some of the departures. And the way the theory departs um, will perhaps guide us in our replacement um, towards the quantum theory of God. But in order for that to be the case, we need to be able to understand what sort of solutions might there be that are of relevance for observations um, to then be able to try to dig out the signals and compare our theoretical expectations with what nature is telling us. So, my argument or my vision of what's going to happen in the next few decades, it will be that now we're going to be probing the, the, uh, the theory to understand very particular solutions in relevant dynamical scenarios, and from that try to obtain precise um, expectations <coughs> that we can then uh, contrast with the uh, observation. So, but I have to set up this, the, the, the tone of the, of, the, of the talk, and so I'll just go uh, basically following the historical path as to what we know about black holes and what and where uh, we may expect <coughs> interesting things to develop. And the reason I consider black holes is because they really represent, at uh, the classical level, the strongest uh, gravitational fields we can think of in the universe. And it's, it is perhaps there where we have our best chances of seeing departures, because after all, the theory has passed amazing tests, amazingly stringent tests, in the solar systems, in binary pulsars, but yet uh, we haven't, we have so far not had a chance of comparing it in regimes directly that involve uh, black holes in very dynamic regimes, and this is what we're able to do uh, right now thanks to gravitational <coughs> waves. So first, let's just kind of re revisit what we know about black holes, and let's start with one. So one black hole that uh, understood as being remarkably simple and clean, um, especially when concentrated in, in four dimensions. And the linear response to perturbations has been understood. So when we have a black <coughs> hole and we just kick it with a, with a little bit of energy, we know the black hole wants to ring down and become quiescent again. And the way it does it is very, uh, very distinctive and very char much characterized with essentially two quantities that typically uh, uh, we use to describe the, 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 these black hole solutions, the mass and the angular momentum. And in the context of binaries, as we'll describe uh, in a little bit, these, uh, these binaries do not seem to significantly alter, alter the simplicity uh, that we seem to be able to uh, uh, get as an understanding of the system. We're going to discuss these two issues, and then we're going to jump into another front, and this is related to the workshop that is going on at this moment uh, here, organized by Amos in Collaborate. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about how we can turn black holes and uh, uh, CFDs as being able to tell a story or part of the story about each other by doing a calculation on one side or the other, depending on where it might be simple. And then we're going to try to, from that, draw some really bold uh, and maybe outrageous uh, implications um, and then open up for the future uh, to, for other uh, studies that will come. So let's go back to one black hole. As I said, black holes are those in the universe are described by what we know as the curve solution. So this is the solution describing a single rotating black hole that is stationary or basically quiescent. When we imagine that we want to perturb it with a small perturbation, we think that the metric of the space-time, this thing that Einstein's theory of relativity tells us to describe uh, the full universe, the fabric of, of, the, of the universe altogether. So we're going to say, well, upon a perturbation, if it is sufficiently small, we're going to imagine that that space-time is written as the quiescent one, the one that corresponds to the solution, plus some small deviation. We put this into Einstein's equations, and keeping uh, everything to linear order, we realize that this, this uh, perturbation obeys an equation of this form that basically says uh, there is uh, a, a kind of almost harmonic dependence with respect to perturbations, but this uh, uh, function, or this parameter here, omega, in reality is complex, has a real and an imaginary part, and it just so happens that the imaginary part has the right sign for this perturbation to describe a decaying perturbation. So once we kick the black hole, the black hole will write its, its, its extra energy away 
to go back to uh, <coughs> astrophysically. This, describe, this description and this uh, observation that black holes are stable is what is used as a foundation of these calculations in astrophysics. That it's interacting with matter around it, or gas, or plasma. This matter, gas, or plasma is not significantly affecting the space time around them. They're just perturbations. And because we kind of have the idea from this analysis that black holes are stable, we can then go on and do a very interesting um, uh, analysis. For instance, this one done by Blanc Forest Nyack that shows how plasma around a rotating black hole is able to extract <coughs> energy from the black hole itself and power perhaps these amazing jets that uh, we saw in, in the early transparency. <coughs> if we move to two black holes, what we have found is that two black holes are almost the same as one plus one, two black holes put together. So we know to leading order that the gravitational waves of a system that has two black holes are coming together and smashing against each other uh, has <coughs> perturbations, this H, with amplitude that go like uh, <coughs> this kind of factors together where in the more important part is this Q here with two time derivatives this is the quadrupole, of, the quadrupole of the source and how it varies with time. Uh, this, the perturbation scales this way and the luminosity, the amount of energy that comes out from the black hole per unit time is given by this, this factor. Importantly, you have to remember that this g to the six, c to the fifth power is an extremely small number, and so the luminosity from these systems is uh, relatively very low, unless we concentrate on really uh, the strongest fields or the strongest objects that are able to produce the most intense gravitational fields in nature, and these are black holes. So it used to be for a very long time that we understood that the collision of black holes would be the ones that had the strongest gravitational radiation, the ones which have the, the best chance to detect with uh, uh, detectors. And we tried to understand what type of signals these sources would produce. And Kip Thorne would go around giving talks, trying to excite both the scientific community uh, to embark in this quest and the taxpayers to pay for it. Um, and Early on, when these objects are far enough from each other, you knew that you could describe Einstein's equations pretty much like Newtonian theory with some correcting terms. Um, and so by and large, you had something like Kepperian laws with a little bit of drift <coughs> that made these objects slowly come together in a, in a sort of well-controlled approximation scheme, uh, theoretically, we could describe this. At very late stages, once the black holes have merged, we have these results that I mentioned before, where a black hole that is kicked will ride in a way the structure will not come back to quiet. But right in, the, in between the regime, where these solids are about to collide and they're moving at a very large fraction of the speed of light, so like a third of the speed of light, and come together, the argument well, maybe the perturbations are sufficiently strong that nonlinear is kicked in and we just have a really royal mess in between. And this required numerical simulations to actually go and, and track the system, which in itself was a very complicated enterprise. But finally, by the uh, mid-2000s, the community as a whole, first uh, done by Franz Pretorius, but very quickly everyone else, was able to do it in, in a variety of different ways. And nowadays, this is what we understand we see. Uh, this is a result of a numerical simulation that shows two black holes coming together. Forget about that initial transient. This is what I, I want to concentrate. We have a sinusoidal uh, behavior that as uh, the orbit gets closer and closer, the amplitude gets larger and larger because a quadrupole is varying on a much shorter uh, time scale. So both amplitude and frequency sweep up. Eventually the merger happens and then you ring down to the quiescent black hole. But if you zoom in in this particular regime, uh, that is described in this murder, you have something that is very, very simple look. And this is a puzzle. So how come you have two black holes coming together, where you essentially are perturbing the field of each other to order one? And yet the theory gives you something that is very, very simple looking, very much like what you had before. If someone had put a gun on anyone's head before we could actually could have solved this problem, and said, give your best guess, well, which perhaps just about, let me just continue to just smoothly join this early stage with this last stage, and it would have been a reasonable approximation of what we really have. You might ask, well, is this what nature provides? Um, and that's what seems to be the case. So in February, uh, the LIGO scientific, LIGO scientific collaboration uh, uh, 
put forward this paper that showed the first results from the first scientific run of the, of the latest generation of detectors. And this is what you see. <coughs> this is uh, at the top frame is the raw data from the experiment, and the bottom frame is the cleanup version of this using the result from theoretical observations, theoretical calculations, <coughs> to uh, clean up a little bit the signal from the, the noise of the detector, which is significant. And you have something that very much looks what you have expected. In fact, you use that to uh, obtain this very well, uh, a, a much better description of the waveform. So I'm not going to describe a lot more about this, but I'm going to raise the question, is this all there is to it? Are we to expect that every time we kick a black hole in a very significant manner, the response would be this simple? And this is very important, because again, we're trying to use observations to try to guide our understanding of the theory itself. And if the theory tells us you should always expect something very simple, you go to the detector and all of a sudden something strange happens in here, then you might start building some confidence that nature in these regimes is described by something else rather than general theory. And understanding that uh, would be ex well, it's extremely important. Of course, even before we go there, we know that we can um, use, keep using what we have uh, in uh, simulations and, and trying to understand <coughs> astrophysical systems. So this is just an illustration of two black holes coming together, the same as what we had before. But as they interact with plasma surrounding them, they generate these two jets that eventually merge into one, have a huge burst of energy, and then they go to the simple-minded, or, or not the simple-minded, the simple model that we had before from that first now. So while we still use it for astrophysics, we want to know precisely what's going on on the gravitational wavefront to try to understand this. A posteriori, once the waveforms were obtained, you could, of course, always come up with a, with a, with a suitable answer. And the suitable answer that the community <coughs> with, uh, has come up with for this is the following. It is true that when these black holes are coming together, they are generating very strong nonlinearities. But you know what? Once the two black holes get close enough, there's a common black hole that forms and just happens to conveniently shield everything, every mess, from an outside observer. So that's a very convenient explanation. There is no way to prove it right or wrong, but it's consistent with the observation. So as we go along, we're going to try to paint a our story and see if we can challenge that with some other interesting story, uh, which at the, end of, at the end of the day may be right, may be wrong, but at the very least will be um, uh, in, uh, uh, promoting some, some different uh, view, which will challenge what we think and will pave the way to perhaps understand better when and how we may have a heart. So this is what we want to ask. Is this all we have to see? Is this all we have to hope to see? Just a very simple-minded uh, behavior? <coughs> or are we uh, expecting at the end of at some corner something other interesting behavior? The problem with general relativity is that it's such a complicated theory from the PDE point of view that just staring at the equations <coughs> doesn't tell you much. And so you need to find out a way to get intuition to perhaps either understand new phenomena or have that intuition guide the right analysis to find out maybe what new phenomena might lie there. And this is precisely what we're going to do. We're going to try to think of what lampposts might be out there that will guide the particular intuition to either explore for new phenomena or test some new effects. And this lamppost um, was given to us uh, already a couple of decades ago uh, by this so-called ADS-CFT uh, duality conjecture. So if you've never heard of it, uh, you probably haven't been talking with string theorists, because every other word is ADS-CFT. Uh, that was a joke, maybe a bad one. Um, <laughs> but what this conjecture says is that in the right regime, uh, the behavior of gravity in a space and that is asymptotically undetectable, so it has a very particular boundary uh, behavior is dual to field theories. And depending on what calculation you want to do, there might be a regime in the CFT that is very difficult to uh, follow. But once you look at it from the point of view of the dual uh, description, it might be a much simpler calculation, and vice versa. So it is a dictionary that maps behavior, behaviors in one regime to behaviors in the other one, and many people are busily working out in many respects, on the formal level trying to have 
ways to prove this conjecture being right or what the limitations might be, or other people taking it from as a fact and then using it to push forward and see if new phenomena comes out or uh, one finds it And so far, every uh, evidence out there pretty much supports that this, the fact that this conjecture is correct. The conjecture is interesting because not only does it couple these two um, <coughs> theories, if you want, or these two fields of study, but in particular it tells you that field theories in two plus in, in d dimensions uh, on this CFT side, they're coupled to gravity in one extra dimension. So what I'm going to do is not go through the whole list of things that you could do, but just concentrate on one. And typically, uh, what people do is they use gravity to try to infer properties of the CFT. But I want to do it in the opposite way. Because there is very, this very interesting thing that we do know. We know that field theories in the right regime, or treated in the right way, where you actually trade out the small uh, length scales in the problem, have admit an effective description that uh, we can cast as a hydrodynamics problem. But if that's, so that we know is true, and if we use the uh, duality, we also know that <coughs> the CFT would be dual to ADS, therefore ADS and hydro should be connected. And now we have a problem the moment we buy that, or at least that's the problem that I was puzzling about a few years ago. If this is true, then that means that we know that hydrodynamics admits very, very interesting behavior in particular dynamic turbulence. But then, does that imply that it, it, gravity itself can go turbulent? Um, if so, uh, this opens up new arenas, because it's something that was, that was not expected. So, in, the, in, the, in this problem, there were kind of two sides of it. On the gravitational side, if you talk to people working on, in general relativity, we have told you, no, no, you shouldn't expect general relativity to, or gravity to go terminate this gravity general relativity, because of a few reasons. So perturbation theory tells us that if you perturb a black hole, you're going to have uh, things just decaying down to quiescent. Yes, yes but, uh, in general, it depends on boundary conditions. Yes. So to get to you have to assume something, how energy is injected into the system, Yes, wait for me. Perfect. Wait for me just a couple of slides and I'm going to go there. In fact, we're going to try to set up some ground rules to, to define what turbulence is. Um, numerical simulations, the ones that we have carried out to do binary black holes collisions, show that no further smaller structure shows up. And typically, people have in the back of their minds when you have turbulence that you've generated this vortices or these eddies, and these eddies break and get smaller ones, and this process keeps cascading down. Uh, and this you never see in the market. Um, and this, also this argument has been used, even though this argument is incorrect, but typically the argument went like this <coughs> follows. Hydrodynamics has shocks and turbulence. General relativity, we know for a fact, mathematically, cannot have shocks. Therefore, it cannot have turbulence as well. This is not a logical argument, but that's when our, it's an argument that was used to in some sense, can't weigh their way around. On the ads -CFT front, however, you say the opposite. Well, you already, if you believe ads -CFT, then there's ads hydrodynamics. Um, and then let me not just go to the other one, but to these other ones, but there, there were a few, uh, a few questions, or a few arguments on that front. So either these arguments are wrong, or these arguments are wrong, and so there are interesting questions to go about. Is there a tension in the correspondence? Is the ads -CFT wrong? Or is something not wrong on the gravitational side? Can we reconcile this behavior that we know that if you perturb a black hole uh, or so slightly, it will decay down to quiescence? If there is turbulence, does turbulence have similar properties or no? And if in the end you establish that ADS, uh, that, uh, gravity has turbulence, what is the an analog of a gravitational rate? Of so we're going to try to answer these questions. But for that, we need to first answer your question. So what do we define turbulence? And sorry I'm going to use a bad analogy, but I, keep, I, I think it's, 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 it's suitable. Uh, some years ago, there was a judge in the US that was trying to define pornography. And he said, well, we don't know, I only know what pornography is when I see it. And with turbulence, typically you have the same reaction. So, well, when I see all sort of vertices that are doing this funny thing, uh, I'm going to call that turbulence. But actually, one can go much deeper than that, and that behavior of seeing Ellis might actually tell us part of the story of something that has gone terrible. So let me just for simplicity concentrate on the Navier-Stokes incompressible case just as a guidance. 
Turbulence usually or typically is characterized by the following properties. It breaks the symmetry of your problem. It's only recovering in a statistical sense if you're driving in a particular way. You also see some <coughs> modes that above some certain criteria, which is usually a high enough rate of number, rate of number uh, has an exponential growth of some mode. This mathematically means that the system is not linearly stable. The solutions to the linearized problem are different from the, different from the solutions to the full nonlinear problem linearized. The global norm of the solution typically has an exponential decay, possibly followed by some power law, and then another exponential. And what I'm thinking here is mainly the so-called decaying turbulence. This is a more general behavior of turbulence. So usually, when think people think of turbulence, they think of the case where you continuously drive it. But that's a special setup that is assumed, or experimentally set up, to simplify the, tra the treatment of a very, very complicated problem. The more general case is that you kick a system that has a particular fluid, you let it go, and maybe, or not, develops disturbance as described or, or, or contained in this definition. In, very importantly, the energy cascade in the system is direct in the uh, in space dimensions equal to 3 or above. That is, you kick the system with some energy at some wavelength, and this energy will go to shorter and shorter wavelengths for a while until it gets dissipated at uh, small enough viscous mass. But in two the space dimensions, it actually goes mainly in the opposite direction. You kick it at some given wavelength, and the wavelength wants to go larger and larger. There is a Reynolds number, again, that determines which way you're going to go. In, for non-relativistic hydrodynamics, you can have this famous uh, uh, behavior of the energy inverse the wave number as the Kolmogorov scaling that has a particular uh, set of power laws. And you can describe uh, correlations between the fluids. So I'm going to use these. These are going to be my criteria for uh, a phenomenon of term. Now I'm going to go to the setup of the fluid gravity correspondence. So remember I said you could use ads CFT, which is a conjecture. And then by using the fact that the CFT has a hydrodynamic description, you can tie ADS and CFT. And this is what these people did, in particular one of them is in the audience. To motivate a particular analysis, that at the end of the day, can completely get rid of ADS CFT. ADS CFT could be 100% wrong, and you would still have this duality between fluid dynamics and gravity. So the way it goes is the following. Suppose you have a, a, a space-time metric. And if you, which I can imagine, this is this square metric, the space of, of a black, rotating black hole, so, which is described by some, function, some constant mass and some constant angular momentum parameter. The way they arrange the perturbation scheme is to assume that these constants are no longer constant, but they are slowly <coughs> varying functions of the coordinates. And you do a great <coughs> expansion. You assume that the derivative of order n of any of these components or of this, this functions here are subleading with respect to one pure derivative. You shove that into Einstein equations, and order by order, you try to see what you get in this gradient expansion. If you stay to zeroth order, what you find out is that Einstein equations on the boundary of ADS, and this is one assumption you make, that this bulk, the, the space time is not losing energy through the boundary. Of course, if you let energy go out, this um, might not happen, but we're going to challenge that uh, uh, as we go along. But you imagine that if you put gravity in this box, so there's a boundary, and if you ask what are the equations, Einstein equations on the boundary, it turns out the Einstein equations on the boundary are precisely the conservation of the stress energy tensor, which is given by a perfect fluid, and that perfect fluid has a very particular equation of state, which is that of um, a, a traceless uh, fluid, which means the equation of state is conformal. And you can keep doing this to next to two more orders has been carried out, and everything goes through. So what you see is that emerging out of the equation, the kinds of equations, there's a way to recast the perturbations in this regime where the gradient expansion is satisfied that Einstein equations are nothing but Navier-Stokes equations or the relativistic hydrodynamic equations with some extra uh, equations to complete the full space. -time. So now we have relativistic hydrodynamics with a very particular equation of state. The question is, does this give rise to turbulence? And if so, then the gravitation, what we're saying is the gravitational field is going to I remember, in particular, I'm interested in a scenario where the boundary 
or this high dynamics that lives in one fear boundary is two plus one dimensions. And the reason I want to do that is because the space-time itself would be three plus one dimensions, and that's the space-time we experience. And eventually, I want to connect it back to possible observations in gravitational waves. One particular property that I say was very peculiar is the fact that in two plus one dimensions, hydrodynamics cascade in the opposite direction. And the reason because it does that is uh, due to another quantity that, uh, is, uh, that is called entropy, it's a very complicated word for me to even pronounce. So you could ask, does this, uh, is there an analog quantity for this kind of fluids in relative hydrodynamics? And the answer is yes, and it doesn't matter, I can show you what it is. But this is typically what you would see. So if we imagine this fluid that lives on this boundary, um, and we put up a particular perturbation of a given flow, and you say, well, what happens as you go uh, in time? This is what you'll see. Initially, nothing fancy is happening, but then you generate all these eddies, and these eddies begin to combine, and they get to larger and larger scales. As I said, the uh, turbulence go in the opposite way. And importantly, I'm like, not driving the system. I just put this initial perturbation, I let it go, and then you see turbulence. There's a way to then try to make uh, closer contact between what we, what people know in aerodynamics and what is going on in the, on the, on the space time. A particularly useful quantity, especially in 2 plus 1 hydrodynamics, is this of vorticity. And you can recognize a whole bunch of different um, truly geometrical uh, calculations, like some bile components, some uh, curvature scatters, all encoding this, vortis, uh, this vorticity in a very clear way. And you can ask, what's, what is the dual in the full space-time of this uh, turbulence on the, on the hydro side or on the boundary side? And so here, when you have a vortex, this vortex essentially extends all the way in. So you have what would be described, what we would describe as, a, a, as, as some certain amount of gravitational radiation that is sufficiently gravitating to keep itself together, but not too gravitating that would make it collapse. So it just stays there. This is something that Wheeler called many years ago uh, a geon. So what we have is essentially a gravitational wave tornado that is growing, or a gravitational wave hurricane that grows because we're in 2 plus 1 dimensions with respect to the boundary, or 3 plus 1 dimensions with respect to the interior. If you do not believe anything I've said on the fluid gravity correspondence, you can say, well, the heck with you. I just want, I will take answers to the questions and fold them and solve them in full in 3 plus 1 dimensions. <coughs> and this is what these fellows here did uh, about six months after our work. They, took a bona fide 3 plus 1 simulation to find the equations with the right boundary conditions, they let it go, and then they ask, does the space time get determined? And indeed, this is what you see. This, this is the calculation that you, the result you get in the 3 plus 1 gravitational calculation, and this is the result you get in the 2 plus 1 hydrodynamical calculation, that once you know this, you can reconstruct the full space time. So we have established, at least in this very particular scenario, turbulence does take it. We can, do one, we can go one step further and do something more fun, which is to think of a fluid that lives on a sphere, so it's fluid propagating, say, on the surface of Earth, and consider where the Earth or, or the net fluid has a net rotational velocity or not. In the language of black holes, that's a black hole that is just sitting there, or it's a black hole that is rotating, and then we either see the, what the behavior of the hydrodynamic description at the boundary. So let me just play all these two movies. Of course, you know that a sphere cannot be patched with a single patch, so we need to do several patches. So this we have, we utilize what we so-called the cube sphere. So you use six patches, glue them together to have a sphere. So this would be north, the north region, the south region, and this is the equator. This is the dual to a short black hole. This is the dual to a rotating black hole. This one has rotation, the other one does not. And this is what you see. So we're gonna just contract the two. I'm showing the vorticity in both cases. You see as the fluid behaves, uh, goes on, uh, turbulence ensues, you initially have some small eddies, the eddies will begin to see each other, if eddies have the same sign, they merge and form larger and larger eddies. Um, eventually this one is going, these ones are going around a space and that has a net rotation, so eventually these vortices will have to uh, propagate towards the poles. So, one particular, the rotation of one particular sign goes to one of the pole and the other one goes to the other pole. And you end up having these two vortices that are going around 
the pole in this way. If there is no net rotation, you end up with some sort of unstable equilibrium that has several, a, a few, four uh, vortices in total, uh, but the moment you put a little bit of rotation, you actually end up with this behavior. And we're going to come back to these <coughs> observations that ultimately, at the end of the day, when you have any rotation, you have a, this, you can describe the state of the system by a whole, if you do a spherical harmonic decomposition, uh, you can have a whole bunch of L's, asymmetral, uh, no, uh, sorry, order, angle, order numbers, and only n equal 1 is describing the asymmetral uh, uh, dependence. But we're going to get back uh, to this for sure. There are also some other interesting observations. Now, if you imagine that you're driving the system, I told you that turbulence is very difficult to understand. One way to try to simplify the analysis of turbulence usually is to assume that you're driving the system, the hydrodynamic system, with a force that injects energy at a particular uh, uh, wavelength, and you study some sort of steady state, and then you do the analysis in the statistical sense. And, um, People have known for a long time what to expect uh, with velocity correlation, <coughs> and recently people have begun studying what type of correlation you expect in the most natural quantity that you have in this uh, in the relativistic case, which is the stress energy tensor of the system. And Yara Moss, uh, not too far from here, had some results for uh, dimension three and above, and in a collaboration that we did uh, very recently, we got the results for two and above with respect to the hydro, which means three plus one or 4 plus 1 and above uh, in, the, in the gravitational uh, side. <coughs> Again, this opens up several questions. If this is a behavior of the stress energy tensor, which I said is a behavior of um, particular packets of uh, gravitational waves, why is it that we have this very different behavior in three dimensions versus four dimensions? Something intrinsically in the space-time is making this thing behave very differently. And we would like to know uh, why. And in particular, we'd like to know why, from a gravitational point of view, for reasons I'll specify if we go along. So, at this point, as just to uh, kind of sum up where we are at the moment, we have established that gravity in ADS, with this, with this particular boundary, can go, uh, um, can go turbulent. And we can link the behavior of hydrodynamics, relativistic hydrodynamics, with the behavior of gravity. We know in hydrodynamics that we pretty much are stuck in turbulence. I mean, we'll go, we, or it takes heroic efforts to gain uh, uh, information. So it's possible, or at least the hope is, that now by having this geometrical light, we can do, uh, or we can take a look at some questions anew. And just as we saw in this, where I argue the first, the second 50 years of general activity, where without knowing the minutia of particular solutions, lots of general results were derived. Maybe, the hope would be, the same could happen on turbulence by coming from the gravitational point of view, the geometrical point of view, and try to infer something on the hydrodynamic side. And so, for instance, one could try to uh, look at some uh, particular well-defined questions in hydrodynamics. For instance, what mediates the merging or splitting of vortices in two versus three spatial dimensions? Can we predict the behavior or the global behavior of solutions in hydrodynamics from geometrical considerations. In geometry, we know what I said uh, at the very beginning of my talk. Some configurations or some general arguments by which if you satisfy some inequality or not, you either have global solutions or you have singularity. And this is an extremely uh, inspiring paper that was written by uh, Jero Moss and Rabinovich a few years ago, which uh, I think it should have uh, gained a lot more attention than it has. And hopefully, as we go forward in the future, it will, uh, it will do so. Um, but, of course, to do that, we need to face a challenge. And resolve the challenge is we need to be able to find answers to these questions for a bona fide general activity calculation of point of view. Otherwise, we haven't gained anything. We keep doing the hydrodynamic calculation. So we need to understand this from gra pure gravity. And moreover, I wanted ultimately, at the end of the day, have a way to perhaps predict some new phenomena in observable uh, gravitational waves with uh, detectors. So I want to answer a few questions at the very least. I mentioned that we have established, or we have established already that turbulence in, uh, in ADA, in space times that have asymptotic in this kind of boundary uh, behavior, have turbulence. 
And so we can ask, is this special of this type of boundaries or is more generic? This is related again to your question. If we're losing energy from the system, uh, would we have, you know, or, you know, would we lose more energy or more energy in the system, would we still have this, this behavior or not? And so we can ask, what is special about having put these boundary conditions? One of the things that, was, that is special from this boundary condition is that we do not lose energy at infinity. Any signal that gets to infinity bounces off that boundary and comes back. So the only place where we lose energy is in the black hole. If we remove this condition and we let the boundary free, with just let any energy that gets there will never come back, maybe the, the, this behavior will go away. But actually, the answer is different from this. The behavior of ADS, so the fact that we don't lose energy at the boundary, what it really is doing is that these quasi null modes that I said describe how a black hole would want to go back to equilibrium are affected in that they are much more slowly decaying than when we don't have the boundary. In, in PD or in nonlinear terms, what we actually would say is that provided the decay of the system is sufficiently slow that nonlinearities have enough time to interact and do something interesting. Turbulence should, should, should behave or should actually uh, take place. So, we're going to try to then remove this, uh, this boundary. Think of the more realistic asymptotic flat space time uh, uh, condition and see if we can actually find a regime where this behavior will actually happen. So, for that, I need to kind of recall some classical mechanics, something I'm sure you all know. If you remember what a parametrically uh, uh, driven oscillator is, and this parametric instability, so if you have an equation of this form, uh, which has some functional, some time dependent functional in this term, for instance, you know that all modes will decay exponentially, except some modes, if you think of this function as described by Fourier mode, that oscillates at a frequency that is related to that frequency by a factor of two. And this is referred to as parametric instability in classical mechanics. So we're going to try to link this behavior to the behavior of perturbations in general theory. But the key, uh, the key observation that we wanted to make is that we want a regime where nonlinearities take a sufficiently long time to decay. So sorry, perturbations take sufficiently long time to decay. The nonlinearities can combine to do something interesting. And it turns out <coughs> that these rotating black holes have a particular regime where this is natural. And this is the regime of very, very highly spinning black holes. So if you have a black hole that is very, spinning very, very close to its maximum allowed uh, spin, these quasi null modes that I mentioned govern the decay of perturbations to linear order, has a, has a, has a decay that's sitting in the imaginary part that's given by the square root of this quantity, kappa, and this kappa is 1 minus a divided by m. This number, the, the, the value that a, the maximum value that a can have is exactly m. So at the limit of a going to m, kappa goes to zero, and then decay rate goes to zero. So if we identify black holes that are extremely highly spinning, at least for the purpose of this calculation, we're going to have what we want, a very slowly decaying perturbation. And so we're going to say, well, what happened if a second mode were to exist in the solution? And how does the space-time, that is now time barring because this uh, mode uh, is there to begin with, or initial mode is there to begin with, what equation does it behave? And it behaves an equation of this type. I mean, it doesn't matter the details. But if you study this equation, this equation has precisely a parametric, a parametric instability with some condition that is given by this. So forget about what happens here, but let me just point out some particular thing. So this omega prime is the frequency, <coughs> the natural frequency of this uh, H1. And omega is the natural frequency of this R1. So if you reduce this, this is a quantity that is small, it's relatively small. So if you satisfy this being greater than zero, you're going to have an exponentially growing mode. And so let's imagine a very particular scenario. Suppose phi has some given asymmetrical number, uh, so asymmetrical number m divided by two. Then in that case, omega and omega prime that I just showed uh, are one omega is omega prime divided by two, so they go away. And so the condition we establish for this mode to actually be able to grow exponentially is precisely the following, that this number, which of course we're going to call it Reynolds number sub g for gravitation, <coughs> that this number is sufficiently large. So h0 is the amplitude of the perturbation, m is the asymmetrical number, and omega is the decay rate of the mode. 
And of course, very, with very simple analysis, we can turn this into something we already know. A0 is the size of the perturbation, let's call it V. M is one of this one. One over M is like lambda, the, the wavelength of the system. And omega is the rate of decay of that mode, which has the analog of the viscosity parameter over density. And if you replace this, this is nothing but what we know as uh, rate of number. So we could ask, what would happen if we have such a black hole and we were to perturb it? Well, at a linear order, or at a, sorry, at the laminar order, if we do not satisfy the, uh, the criteria I just mentioned, if you kick it with some given mode, let's say you kick it with an L equal to M equal to mode, you just get an L equal to M equal to decay. But if you actually satisfy that, you actually generate a whole bunch of modes in L, but all have M equal 1. So the system cascades from the L2, M2 mode to an M equal 1 <coughs> mode with a whole bunch of L. And this is precisely the kind of behavior we saw in the simulation of a fluid with respect to or, or uh, moving on a background that is rotating. If we were to observe a black hole of spin 0.998, and LIGO is detecting the gravitational waves, and thinks that the linearized calculation is good enough to obtain, uh, the, the, to the, to obtain the, what the black hole is showing, this calculation is showing that no, there is energy in other modes that came out from the main mode, and if you did not know that this would happen, you actually would be perhaps tempted into conclude gravity is behaving differently. It's not what we expected from the linearized calculation. And this is just saying that we have a regime where the problem is linear, actually linearly not stable. The solution to the linearized problem is not the same as the solution to the nonlinear problem. But now is where I'm just going to go and do the, kind of the exaggeration of the day. I can also ask, how generic is this? Because after all, I just told you that the convenient regime where we were going to do the calculation was this one that had a spin of the black hole really, really large, so that the decay rate was very slow. Turns out that, let's think again of what LIGO might see, or one of these gravitational wave detectors would see. Let's see, say, for instance, if this regime is one black hole, another black hole that is hollow. So let's imagine that you have a black hole that is sufficiently high spinning. And this would be like a driving force. You have two black holes going around each other. So we're continuously <coughs> driving the system with a particular uh, frequency. And if the black hole happens to be to have sufficiently high speed, uh, Hadar, Porphyriaris, and Strominger answered the question of what would be the strength of the amplitude of the perturbations that these two black holes will have as they go around each other. Well, it just so happened that this amplitude, the H0, which so far we have thinking about, well, suppose there is an uh, it's a perturbation. Let's imagine now that perturbation comes from this interaction. This perturbation scales like this kappa to the p power. But interestingly, that's exactly the same uh, behavior of this omega uh, with respect to kappa. So you would have this object behaving like this kappa to the, uh, the p power, to a p power. Omega also has kappa to the p power. And we know how to simplify, so we can simplify, and it seems that to linear order, it really doesn't matter what the spin of the black hole was. And so the extrapolation is that, yes, we did a calculation in the regime of very high spin, because that's where we could do this, track this very complicated uh, perturbation uh, analysis. But it seemed to be much more generic than we uncovered. And perhaps the way to answer why this is so simple is not to invoke the event horizon to completely hide every nasty thing from the observer, but actually to use turbulence. That this behavior, as the black holes are coming together, they are pumping energy into these higher modes, but we are actually in two, in, this is in three plus one dimensions, but on the hydro, from the hydro point of view, it behaves like in two plus one dimensions, that energy has to come back to the lower wave. And so, what we could be to it, and otherwise creating this nonlinear mode, this nonlinear, the energy we dump there gets swept back to the longer wavelength, and it would be a natural way to just explain the simplicity of the simulations. Of course, we have to be very careful, and this way I said that this conjecture might be half wrong. Because after all, a cat has four legs, and so has a table, and not, they are definitely not the same piece. But um, there is su sufficient tantalizing uh, hints here that 
actually call for a more in-depth study and there are uh, several <coughs> groups including uh, uh, myself and collaborators looking at different um, regimes where this instability or this behavior um, uh, would show up. So just to conclude, let me just keep on the provocative end. But on one hand, what we have established, and I have absolutely no, no, no fear of betting my house that this is true, the gravity does go turbulence in the right regime. What we lack for a very long time is this intuition that was brought in by this ads -CFT, at least from the motivational point of view, to look for the right behavior and identify what the right domain was. And so there is such a thing as a gravitational range of number. And if we are supported, if we are if we're larger than that, then gravity would have this interesting behavior. ADS is convenient, so ADS helps in having this regime be much more generic. But it's not necessary. There are regimes in asymptotic flat space times or in realistic space time where this would take place. I actually am positive that there are possible observable consequences, and it would be interesting to, or it would be important to be prepared for this. Once we try to use gravitational wave observations to try to kind of put general relativity to a stress test. Much more uh, intriguing or, or opening up is every single possible consequence we can think of uh, turbulence might be implying on the gravitational uh, uh, on, the, on, on gravity itself. The, in particular, the geometrization of turbulence and what may be what we may be able to do to infer or, or shed some more light in the phenomena, the general phenomena of, of, or general studies of aerodynamics and turbulence in particular. This tantalizing uh, tension or difference between the behavior of energy cascading in 2 plus 1 versus 3 plus 1 and what that implies in, in gravity is very interesting. And it actually may have a hidden, hidden in it a way to try to explain or argue for or against cosmic censorship. And one interesting behavior of gravity, or of turbulence, is that it has this self-similar fractal behavior, and so the space-time in the right regime would have this fractal behavior. And to conclude, I just want to say this is the fact that gravity itself can show fractal behavior is not new. And I'll show you one example of a black hole in higher dimensions. So if you take a black hole, imagine the right in four dimensions, you add an extra dimension, and this extra dimension is sufficiently long, the black hole goes unstable. And I'll show you this, uh, uh, some work uh, uh, we did with Franz Pretorius a few years ago. So I show this, I end up with this movie and another one that shows, in this particular case, what you see in green is the size of the event horizon of this black hole that we're going to perturb it and we're going to see what happens. As you perturb, oops, that wasn't good. There is, you see the perturbations, it has some quasi modes that want to decay, but you have some other ones that actually take over as an exponential growth, thin some regions while exponent change another one, and this process keeps going on and on and on. We were able to resolve four generations of this numerically, and eventually some pieces of this string would thin themselves down to zero, uh, to zero size, thereby uh, showing a violation of cosmic censorship. And this is not too dissimilar to something we already know. There is a so-called Rayleigh plateau instability, and Oscar uh, Diaz here was one of the first ones to point this out. That actually say that in high dynamics we have this behavior as well, and hopefully this movie works. Just to gross you up, uh, this is what you have can do with human saliva. Again, so this has a fractal dimension that you can you can calculate. It gives you pretty much the same as this one, and there are many uh, analogies between this problem and that problem. So I'm not saying at the end of the day everything maps one to one, but thinking of this kind of analysis of, uh, of a very related uh, phenomenon <coughs> in more than one way has inspired and has guided some new results in gravity, which is again the theory that so far, with a few exceptions, I think we know not enough. Uh, but the future is definitely bright of what's going to happen in the next few decades. So, thank you.